And we'll come to order. This morning we're holding a hearing on the nominations of two individuals the committee knows well, but important that we get them into their continued role. I'm pleased to welcome Jennifer Hamadi, the chair of the National Transportation Safety Board, who has been nominated for a five-year term, and Patrick Fuchs, who has been renominated for a five-year term on the Service Transportation Board. Chair Hamadi has guided the NTSB through some of the most high-profile transportation accidents this nation has seen in recent memory, including the East Palestine derailment, the Alaska Airlines door plug accident, and now the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse, which claimed the lives of six individuals and closed the port of Baltimore, causing significant disruption to our national freight network. I'm so sorry for the loss of lives that occurred at the bridge and a constant reminder of who's built our nation, the hardworking men and women who take these risks and do this job. And uh, we mourn their loss and give our prayers to their family. Uh, she has led this investigation uh, with independence and integrity to discover the factors that are so important to not have history repeat itself and all the while continuing to improve the structure at the NTSB. Under her leadership, the agency has eliminated a backlog of 442 overdue investigation reports, worked to ensure the agency has the resources needed to adapt to emerging technologies, and the committee has one example marked up the FAA bill, including robust NTSB recommendations. That's, I believe, how the system is supposed to work. The NTSB, clearly a watchdog, doing the hard, hard, hard investigative work reminding us what else needs to be improved in the system. The Senate bill requires the FAA to finalize the 25-hour cockpit recording rule. That is clear as it can be from you, Chair Hamadi, the necessary recordings that help you on your investigation. As we know, the cockpit recording in the Alaska Airlines incident was overwritten, uh, complicating your investigation. So we are working hard with our House colleagues to get an agreement and send the FAA bill to the President's desk. I also want today to focus on the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. I commend the brave members of the United States Coast Guard, first responders who quickly conducted search and rescue efforts, and thanks to President Biden and Army Corps of Engineers to tirelessly work with reopening the Port of Baltimore, the Department of Transportation has already made $60 million available to the state to aid in the rebuilding efforts, but we know much more is needed. So we stand ready to assist the people of Maryland and our important trade and transportation infrastructure that our economy counts on, and look forward to hearing from you any updates on that investigation this morning. Uh, Mr. Hughes, a former Commerce Committee staffer for Senator Thune, so it's great to have you back before the committee being out there. I wonder if you remember all the questions you wrote for members before. <laughs> we should dig some up. <laughs> but thank you so much for your, <laughs> your continued uh, work uh, with the board through the COVID-19 pandemic, which we saw uh, historic issues related to rail service. And following the East Palestine derailment, the committee found from 2017 to 2021, the Class 1 railroads infrastructure investment were cut by 25% and employees cut by 22% while the incident of accidents increased 14%. So I'm concerned about how we guarantee rail safety for the future and as a state in an economy that uh, let's just say is very Pacific focused, a lot more volume is uh, Midwest products all just throughput for our state. So we want the rail to work and work effectively and with resiliency. So I look forward to hearing from you about how we do that. Um, and now I'll turn to Ranking Member Cruz for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome to our witnesses, National Transportation Safety Board Chair Hammondy and Surface Trans Transportation Board Member Fuchs. I, I want to thank the both of you for your willingness to serve a second term at these posts. The NTSB serves the important function of thoroughly investigating transportation incidents to identify their causes and to recommend changes to prevent similar incidents. The NTSB also gives valuable information to Congress and to federal agencies when developing transportation policy. Chairwoman Hammondy has performed her roles at the NTSB well, advocating for safety regardless of the politics. For example, she has correctly observed the dangers of electric vehicles because of their increased weight and the risk of battery fires. She has worked diligently to investigate several high-profile 
transportation incidents, such as the disrailment uh, in East Palestine, Ohio, the door plug blowout of Alaska Airlines Flight 1282, and most recently, the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Chairwoman Hammondy, I look forward to hearing from you about your plans for a second term as a member and the head of the NTSB, as well as an update on recent investigations, including the 737 MAX 9. I was troubled when my questions to you at last month's hearing revealed that Boeing had not fully cooperated with the NTSB investigation into the 737 MAX 9. I'm glad to see that, working together, we were able to get NTSB and Boeing's relationship back on track. I also want to take a moment to address the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse. First, this was a tragic incident, and my condolence to all the families of the six workers who died. Recognizing the NTSB is just beginning its investigation, I hope we hear an update today on any preliminary information that can be shared. Second, I want to discuss efforts to rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge. I think the federal government needs to help to rebuild the bridge. Its collapse affects more than just the Baltimore region. With court cases likely taking years to resolve, it is also sensible for federal taxpayers to front the money now with legal protections so that taxpayers are paid back by the legally responsible parties. But it's entirely reasonable to act now to fund it. But we all must also minimize the bureaucratic dithering and delays that are all too prevalent with construction projects under the Biden administration. Whether it's a new semiconductor plant funded by the CHIPS Act, a cross-border bridge, or a deep water port approval, this administration seems to only allow construction or economic activity after extreme environmentalists have given them a hall pass. There's no reason for there to be a lengthy environmental permitting review over whether to build a new bridge at the exact same location as the previous bridge. The bridge's reconstruction shouldn't be delayed another day or subjected to policy riders that raise costs to satisfy favored Democrat constituencies. I hope this committee will also hear from DOT officials who oversee reopening the port, federal transportation grants, and parts of the rebuilding process. Today's high CPI number shows that inflation is still far too high and leading to higher prices for consumers at the grocery store, the gas pump, and the shopping mall, all of which are hurting American families. The extended closure of the Baltimore port will only throw fuel into the raging Bidenflation fire by snarling supply chains and raising the cost of consumer goods. Given the importance of the port to the economy, one has to wonder, is our federal government treating this like an emergency? I ca cannot help but think that China would have cleared the wreckage in days. I hope that this episode doesn't become another punchline about a nation in decline or a symbol of our incre increasingly sclerotic and bureaucratic approach to public works projects. The second nominee we will hear from today is Patrick Fuchs. He has been renominated to be a member of the Surface Transportation Board, or STP, which primarily oversees railroad rates, services, and practices. Mr. Fuchs has extensive knowledge of the rail network and is an asset to the STB. He has worked collaboratively on solutions to challenges facing the network, which is reflected in the overwhelming preponderance of unanimous decisions the board has issued during his tenure, as well as the fact that here in the audience today are so many of his Democrat and Republican board colleagues. He has also received support from a wide range of stakeholders. Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent that these letters of support for Mr. Fuchs from many groups, such as the Teamsters and agriculture stakeholders, be included in the record. Without objection. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from both nominees. Thank you so much, Senator Cruz. Uh, Chair Hamadi, your uh, opening statement, and again, thank you for your willingness to serve another term. Thank you, and thank you both, and thank you to the members of the committee for the opportunity to appear today as you consider my nomination to serve as chair and member of the National Transportation Safety Board. 
I'm grateful to President Biden for the confidence he's placed in me through these renominations. And I'm especially honored to testify today alongside my longtime friend and colleague, Commissioner Fuchs, and encourage the committee to, re to consider his swift reconfirmation. I also want to thank Member Alvin Brown for joining me today. I'd like to begin by introducing my husband, Mike, and thank him and my daughter, Lexi, for their unfailing patience, encouragement, and support. We often forget that the sacrifices we make impact those closest to us. I am, however, in excellent company. Our agency's dedicated safety professionals often miss birthdays, holidays, and graduations to carry out our mission. Serving as the NTSB's 44th board member and leading the agency as its 15th chair has been the absolute greatest honor of my career and my lifetime. These roles are not a job. They are my passion. On day one as chair, I announced my vision for the agency in two words, mission first. It comes from meetings I held with employees throughout the agency who shared what they believed were our greatest challenges. And here's what I heard. Our budget and headcount had been stagnant for decades. We had nearly 60 vacancies which required our workforce to do more with less. Our backlog of investigative reports was unacceptably high. Same for our ALJ petitions. We didn't have reliable data to drive decision making and we were more focused on training external safety partners than our own staff. I'm incredibly proud to say all that has changed thanks to our agency's senior career leadership and unrivaled staff. It is a team effort. In 2017, we hired just seven people. Last year, we hired 71, including our first ever chief human capital officer. NASA's loss is our gain. Thanks to her leadership, we have 430 people on board today and we're growing. These are modest staffing increases when you consider the rising demands on our people who are leading increasingly complex investigations, 2,200 domestic and 450 cases annually. We eliminated the backlog of investigative reports over two years old from a high of 442 to zero at the end of FY23. Our ALJs didn't only decrease their backlog, they eliminated it. We launched our first ever agency-wide data program. That program, which is in its infancy, will enable us to use internal and external data to drive our decision making. In fact, we're already using data to improve our operations, which has allowed us to dramatically decrease our time to hire, as well as the average age of open investigation reports. We accomplished all of this while getting back to the office safely following the pandemic a full six to 12 months ahead of most other federal agencies. In addition to leading the NTSB, I proudly and fiercely advocate for our safety recommendations. I'm fueled by the experiences I've gained launching on numerous investigations. On scene, I believe my most important duty is to brief the families of the victims. They are why I fight so hard for our recommendations, why the oath I took to well and faithfully discharge the duties of my office is so important. I've sat with too many bereaved families following tragedies that were preventable. If confirmed, I pledge to build on our agency's many successes, to be guided by our evidence, facts, to ensure Team NTSB has what we need to carry out our mission. I further vow never to waver as a transportation safety advocate and partner to each of you. But before I close, I want to share how proud I am of the NTSB workforce. To them I say, I have never met a more dedicated, knowledgeable team. You are world-renowned experts, and for good reason. You're, at, you're the absolute best and brightest in your field. I am thankful to work alongside you every single day in pursuit of safety, and no matter what happens with my nominations, you are the real leaders of the NTSB. You drive our mission. Thank you for your service, and thank you all. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Again, welcome, Mr. Fuchs. Thank you so much for your willingness to serve again. Thank you. Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz, and distinguished members of the committee, 
Thank you for inviting me to appear before you as a nominee to serve on the Surface Transportation Board. It is an honor to be nominated for a second term. At the outset, I want to thank three special people in the audience, my wonderful wife, Catherine, and parents, Joe and Jeannie, for their countless sacrifices and unwavering support. I want to recognize one special person at home, my magical two-year-old daughter, Josephine. I'm extraordinarily grateful to all my family and friends, as well as to the entire team at the STB, especially the talented people in my office, Lisa Nilvins and Stephanie Borges. I remain immensely thankful to Senator Thune for the opportunity to see firsthand the critical work of this committee to improve our nation's transportation system and strengthen supply chains. I've learned from his leadership, the members of this committee, and the excellent congressional staff with whom I've had the honor to serve. It is also a privilege to appear on this panel with a former fellow staff member, Chair Hammondy, a tireless and conscientious champion for safety. At my first confirmation hearing, I pledged to bring to this position a respect for the value of cooperation, dedication, and openness in government service. This respect grew significantly through my experience managing regulatory reviews at the Office of Management and Budget and implementing the policies and priorities of this committee. Today, I want to share the ways in which I've applied these values during my service on the board to help protect and enhance the flow of America's commerce. First, I've approached my position with an appreciation for the benefits of collaborating with colleagues. While board members have different views and overarching philosophies, we, work, we have worked collegially and constructively to address matters before the agency. Together, we have conducted rigorous oversight of rail service problems and imposed beneficial transparency and accountability measures. We have instituted protections for customers facing railroad demerge and other charges. We have streamlined avenues for relief through changes to the emergency service process and the market dominance inquiry. The board approved each of these policy changes by unanimous vote. I'm honored that all of the board members that I have served with, former Chairman Begeman and current Chairman Oberman and members Hedlund, Primus, and Schultz could attend today's hearing. I have greatly benefited from the insights of each of these accomplished colleagues. Second, I have worked diligently to examine and decide the cases presented to the board. With its highly skilled and hardworking staff, the agency has issued more than 2,000 decisions and orders during my tenure. Several transactions have con consumed substantial time and attention because of their ramifications for the network. The board considered the first major merger in more than 20 years, the first significant tra transaction in more than 10 years, and other impactful construction and acquisition proceedings. Through our work in public hearings, and on agency decisions, my colleagues and I have probed the effects of transactions, the details of company plans, and the specifics of voluntary agreements. We have imposed appropriate conditions to protect competition, address environmental impacts, and hold parties to their representations. The agency's efforts have facilitated new transportation options and capital investments while mitigating potential harm and safeguarding the public interest. Third, I have fulfilled my duties with a spirit of openness with the public. Outside formal proceedings, I value open communication with all who might come before the board, from rail shippers, carriers, workers, and suppliers, to nonprofits, passenger rail advocates, and other government bodies. America's rail system is essential to our nation's economic strength and broader quality of life, and it depends on a wide range of people with a wide range of interests, sometimes conflicting and competing, to make it work. In advisory council meetings, on the ground engagements, and many other informal settings, I've spent significant time learning from a broad cross-section of the public, sharing my own views, and discussing ways to improve agency policy and our transportation system. Open exchange of experiences, opinions, and ideas deepens the board's oversight efforts and facilitates proactive problem solving. If confirmed, I would continue to apply these values, cooperation, dedication, and openness, as the board confronts complex challenges. The board has a robust workload, and I know many of our proceedings are important to this committee, from new rail services and projects to valuable regulatory protections and improvements. It would be an honor to continue working with this committee and your staff to ensure an efficient, competitive, and sound rail system. I appreciate your consideration, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Fuchs. Thank you so much. Chair Hamadi, on Monday, an 89,000-ton uh, vessel lost power near New York's Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Thankfully, it was guided by tugs to continue on its journey safely. It's just another reminder that these aren't, these aren't one-off incidents. In 1981, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Tampa, Florida, uh, collapsed and 35 people uh, were killed. In my state, uh, the Lewis and Clark Bridge is an example of a bridge with just the wooden 
barriers to protect uh, from a boat strike, but they have deteriorated. So I want to hear from you what other uh, updates you might have for us on this uh, particular incident, what we can do to safeguard vulnerable bridges in the United States, and what is the status of the 1981 recommendations the Coast Guard made after those incidents to try to strengthen the bridges. I'm just going to put a lot on your plate, but you're here for renomination, so I guess it's another uh, test. But uh, again, as the chief's safety uh, steward for our nation, we need aggressive advocacy as well as it relates to safety fixes. Um, you were last here, we asked you about whether you were getting the information on the Alaska accident and whether you have received that information. You've since updated the committee on that. Um, but any further updates on uh, the challenges you faced in getting information? One of the things that's transpired since you were here is that the ODA expert panel came out with their analysis that there was a disconnect between senior management and those down the line on what the safety culture actually is. Um, what can NTSB do to further examine the state of the safety culture to make recommendations uh, to us uh, as we continue to move through the challenges of making sure that aviation safety, the FAA, and the oversight is done correctly? So sorry to throw a lot at you, but. That's why we're nom why you're nominated for a second term. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll start with the update on Baltimore. We've come uh, conducted a number of interviews. We've interviewed the pilots, and I'm going to make sure, if you don't mind, I'd like to consult my notes to make sure that I stick with the facts. Uh, we've co uh, conducted interviews with the pilots, the second officer who was the man on watch at the time, the master on the bridge, the chief engineer the third assistant engineer, the helmsman, the bosun, the chief officer who was off watch, second officer, second officer who conducted pre-departure uh, checks, second assistant engineer, electrician, oiler, and three US Coast Guard watch standers at the command center uh, and received tugboat operator statements and were continuing to conduct interviews. Uh, most people don't realize we're actually still on scene. Our investigative team is on the vessel as we speak. Uh, we downloaded the VDR, the voyage data recorder on scene, and then we removed the VDR uh, in order to download uh, the past 30 days in our lab to learn from that. Uh, we formalized uh, parties to the investigation. I'm pleased to say that Grace, Grace Ocean and Synergy have become parties to our investigation, as well as the US Coast Guard, Maryland Transportation Authority, and the Association of Maryland Pilots. We have had the manufacturer uh, of, of uh, equipment in the engine room uh, to look closely at the electrical power system. Uh, we're continuing to look at that. Uh, we've asked for additional assistance from the manufacturer who returned from overseas this week with experts to look at the circuit breakers. Uh, in addition to that, our Office of Highway Safety Team is really focused on peer protection, looking at the original bridge design and how it would be built today, under today's standards. I expect, uh, regardless of some uh, erroneous press report from Bloomberg, that our preliminary report will not be out until the first week of May. We are still on scene collecting information. Uh, we have a lot of work ahead. Uh, there is a lot we've learned, uh, but I will say that we have issued recommendations going back to uh, 1979, really 1976, but 1979 uh, and 1981 to the US Coast Guard. Uh, to look at the type of vessels and shipping in waterways across the United States, the volume of traffic, and peer protection. Uh, the U.S. Coast Guard at the time uh, stated that they did not have the authority to do that, so it was never done. They did do a review of the types of peer protection out there, but uh, not on specific areas. Uh, so with that, I can answer additional questions on that. I'm sure there are a number of areas you'd like to delve into, but we have a lot of work to do still on this investigation and happy to provide any more information on that. Maybe if I get it a second round, but if you could address the aviation issue. Yeah, so uh, we are in Renton this week. We're back in Renton and we're doing uh, interviews uh, of Boeing and the Federal Aviation Administration this week. Uh, we 
The records don't exist that we're looking for, uh, which is a what we would call an escape from normal process. And so uh, we are looking at other instances uh, where the door, uh, a door plug was opened and closed to make sure that those records are available and we're looking at how this happened. Uh, what I will say is Boeing has been a party to many of our investigations uh, and they are play a key role here. I don't think there's anyone at Boeing from Dave Calhoun down that doesn't wanna know what happened here. They want to know, and they want to fix it. And we're there to help. Uh, but we're also there to look at what more can be done, what the safety culture is, what the safety management system is. It's relatively new, and how that can be improved, and their quality management system. So we do have a lot of work to, to do. Uh, I will say you asked about one of the tools we could use. We don't know if we're going to yet. It's a little early to tell. Uh, but one tool we could use uh, is safety culture survey. We just issued a survey with the help of Norfolk Southern to their entire workforce, almost 20,000 employees. And we're, it's an anonymous survey to, talk, to learn about safety culture. The leadership at Norfolk Southern also wants to know. We're getting a great response, and we could do that here. And, and why wouldn't you? I, I, I don't want to get ahead of our investigators. They're still collecting information, and that's something that they need to pursue. And, and on this case, you're saying, in this case, records don't exist, but you have other records that show when door plugs were opened and closed. There are other instances where that kind of uh, repair was documented. There, there are other instances where that work would occur. We still have to review all those instances to see if that was documented. Okay, so you don't know whether those were documented yet or not? Not yet. Okay, thank you. But we do have the information. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Fuchs, let me start with you. Uh, the STB has a long history of working towards consensus on decisions. Can you please explain your views about the importance of consensus-based decision-making and how you will work towards doing so. Thank you for your question, Ranking Member Cruz. As you suggest, the vast majority of the board's decisions have had consensus. Each of my colleagues has valuable insights, and the board's work has been strengthened from factoring in competing perspectives and gathering diffuse information. We regulate a complex network industry that has large, long-term capital investments. There are benefits from regulatory certainty. Consensus has not only helped the quality of agency action, but also its long-term stability. In terms of my approach, I want to first give credit to the chairman for uh, his efforts uh, to listen and engage with all members, even in instances where we do not agree. For me, it starts with a fundamental respect for my colleagues, their experiences, their knowledge, and their views. I also bring persistence. It's not always easy to come together, but I'm certainly committed to trying. If confirmed, I would continue to value consensus to strengthen the board's decision and provide needed certainty to shippers and carriers alike. Thank you. Uh, Chair Hammondy, uh, I appreciated your thorough report of the investigation that is ongoing about the accident at the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The video of the dolly right before it collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge shows that the vessel's lights were turning on and off, suggesting a potential issue either with the engine or the electrical system. I understand you're just beginning your investigation into the incident. However, is there anything you can tell us about what may have caused the vessel's lights to turn on and off? And do you anticipate that whatever affected the lights may have contributed to the loss of, of vessel control? I do believe they're related, uh, as does our investigators. Our investigators are on scene. Uh, they needed the assistance of Hyundai, who is the manufacturer of equipment in the engine room, to download data from the electrical power system and look at the circuit breakers. That is where our focus is right now in this investigation. Of course, that's preliminary. Uh, it could take different uh, roads, different paths as we continue this investigation. It's very early, uh, but we're collecting that data. A voyage data recorder provides very basic information, not like a flight data recorder. Uh, so there isn't enough information on that to understand. It's really a, a, what was going on in the engine room. It's really a snapshot 
of the major systems on a vessel. Uh, so that information in the engine room will help us tremendously. Thank you. That's, that, that, that's helpful. Um, also, have all the parties so far been cooperating with the NTSB's investigation? Yes, sir. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, if that changes, would you please let this committee know? Yes, sir. And if I may also add, I want to thank the Federal Bureau of Investigation and uh, the U.S. Coast Guard for their partnership on scene. It was very helpful. Very good. Uh, all right, Chair Hamidi, I want to shift to a different topic. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about many federal agencies post-pandemic telework policies that enable federal employees basically never to come to the office. For example, many of the employees at the Department of Transportation are fully remote. These folks have never come into the office at all. Many others only come in one day or maybe two days per week, spending much more of their paid work time at home rather than in the office. Chair Hamidi, do you believe that having workers come into the office is important for the work of the NTSB? Sir, I believe in in-person work. I believe it is very difficult, especially with a workforce that's uh, one third of our workforce is new. How do you get rooted in the culture of an agency, in the duties that you have to perform? How do you have uh, camaraderie, develop teamwork, get peer-to-peer -peer training, have those conversations, those meaningful conversations face-to-face, -face, the conversations that happen in the hallways, even before meetings or after meetings, if you're sitting at home. So I'm not popular for that position in my agency, but I believe we have to be at work. At home, you cannot do those things. And uh, so uh, I will admit, uh, we are still one of the best small agencies in the federal workforce to work for, but we've taken a hit because of this. But this is my standard. We need to be at work. On a Tuesday, and I had our data officer, data program, this is where the successes are, look at the swipes that we get on a Tuesday for our, our, the cards coming in. 73% of our workforce is in on a typical Tuesday. The, the ones who aren't are investigators that frankly are across the United States and should be across the United States investigating different accidents and incidents. But everyone else needs to be in work. We have to be there. Uh, you do not, again, you cannot get rooted in the culture if you're coming to work uh, two times a pay period. And frankly, we've lost employees because we can't compete with that. But I'm sorry, there are many people who love to work at the NTSB and that's why they come in. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, that, that was helpful. And I, I will say to the chairman of the committee that I, I hope this committee examines this issue more closely and I would love to see bipartisan cooperation on this committee. In the Senate, we all come to work, uh, our staffs come to work, in the private sector, virtually every private sector employees, their employees are coming to work. And apparently the, the club fed that we have in terms of federal agencies believes it is perfectly okay for the taxpayers to pay thousands upon thousands of people who never show up at the damn office. And part of the responsibility of this committee is oversight. And, and I would hope we could see some bipartisan agreement that if you're gonna draw a paycheck from the taxpayer, and in many instances, a six-figure paycheck, that you ought to actually show up at work and, and do your job. Well, Senator Cruz, I'm happy to look at this issue. I'm a huge believer that we live in an information age and that the only thing that's gonna hold us back from innovating is collaboration. And it's just a lot harder to collaborate over Zoom, in my opinion. So happy to look at this with you. Um, Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank both of our witnesses today for their public service. Uh, Ms. Hamandi, I, I am such a big fan of the National Highway Transportation Safety Board. It's now over 50 years and one of the most remarkable records of nonpartisan success that we can see anywhere in government. And I sometimes go back over and look at all the investments that have been made uh, through uh, the board and and the the results, the reduction in accidents, the reduction in fatalities, the reduction in um, 
and uh, emergency room visits. Uh, it's really a remarkable uh, record, and I, 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 rec I salute both of you for your efforts to make sure this is maintained, um, which I think clearly you're both committed to doing. So, Ms. Hamandi, first, um, last October, a train passing through Pueblo, Colorado, fell off the tracks, spilled coal across I-25, uh, resulted in the fatality of a truck driver. Uh, the preliminary investigation from the uh, NTSB said the train derailed because of a broken rail. Um, how can Congress ensure that we're modernizing and upgrading our railways uh, systems and the infrastructure uh, consistently in order to prevent derailments and improve safety outcomes for passengers, think, freight. Thank you so much for the question, Senator. Uh, in fact, we issued a recommendation recently after a derailment in Joplin, Montana, where we feel that broken rail uh, detection uh, equipment technology uh, called autonomous track monitoring systems uh, can provide immediate immediate information to a railroad uh, when there is a track defect. So that is a recommendation we've issued. Uh, hopefully that can be adopted uh, by the railroads. And in addition to that, uh, we have recommended for many years uh, the implementation by railroads of safety management systems. And so we continue to work with them on that. Uh, I will also mention we do have about 190 open uh, rail recommendations, which I'm happy to provide to you and your staff as well. Great, well, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I also will get to the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge uh, issues. Uh, that bridge diverted or halted, I guess you'd say, uh, 30,000 uh, vehicles daily. All marine traffic has been stopped. Uh, Western interstates are similarly connected to the supply chains in that same critical fashion, making sure goods get transported through our region. Uh, 2021, Glenwood Canyon, uh, we had a mudslide that closed down I-70 uh, in Colorado for uh, uh, many days, weeks. Uh, resilient infrastructure can help keep our critical and integral supply chains running consistently. So has the NTSB issued any safety recommendations to improve safety in our corridors to any agency which remain outstanding? We have many recommendations, which I'm happy to provide uh, uh, for the record. Uh, if I may also add to all your comments uh, that we are uh, deeply sorry uh, to the families uh, for the loss of six individuals as a result of that bridge striking and um, uh, collapse, four of which I will just note uh, are still unaccounted for. Uh, so we have a family assistance team working with the families. Uh, but again, back to the recommendations, happy to provide those for the record. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fuchs, again, thank you for your service. Uh, really appreciate that. Railroads are a safe, reliable, efficient transportation solution for passengers and freight. Um, just last week, I toured the Federal Railroad Administration's Technology Transportation Technology Center, which is down in Pueblo, Colorado, quite a ways. You've got to drive out a good 15 or 20 miles from uh, any civilization to see what the R&D and safety testing, how that's unlocking the potential for high speed and hydrogen rails potential. Um, during the pandemic, shortages and bottlenecks highlighted how essential rail is for supply chains. How is STB's work to promote fair competition, improve reliability and resilience in our supply chains? Thank you for the question, Senator. And I've had the honor of going out to Pueblo as well to see the exciting technology there. Um, <clears throat> the STB has been focused on ensuring a resilient rail network. We imposed unprecedented transparency and accountability measures. Uh, we're currently working on a proposal to enhance carriers' incentives to provide adequate service. We've streamlined our emergency service order process so we can work quickly, and we maintain our case-by-case uh, -case authority for, for adjudications. Um, we are using all the tools um, at our disposal where appropriate to ensure that we have a sound, competitive, and efficient freight rail system. Great. Thank you so much, and keep up the good work, both of you. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Chair. 
Ormadade, during last month's hearing, we discussed my concerns over the safety implications of electric vehicles. Those concerns range from our current roadway designs, not accounting for the increased weight, to first responders trying to respond to EV collisions. I worry that in its mission to push more EVs on consumers, this administration has been short-sighted on the safety challenges of this new technology. Acknowledging the work that is already underway, if confirmed, will you commit to working with me to better understand the safety implications from EVs on our roadways? Senator, if confirmed, I would be pleased to work with you, and thank you for your leadership on this. Thank you very much. As we know, the high-voltage lithium-ion batteries in EV vehicles pose risks to those first responders. And I know that NTSB conducted a study on this topic and made re um, recommendations to NHTSA on that. Are there any recommendations that your agency made to NHTSA that have yet to be addressed? And if so, what are they? Yes, Senator. Uh, as part of a study we did, uh, as you mentioned, on lithium-ion batteries and risk to uh, first responders and secondary responders, meaning tow operators, we issued a recommendation that states that uh, the NHTSA should convene a coalition of stakeholders to research ways to mitigate and de-energize the stranded energy in high-voltage lithium-ion batteries and reduce the hazards associated with thermal runaway resulting from high-speed, high-severity crashes. They have not done anything on this. It is currently open, unacceptable. Are there any recommendations to better educate the first responders on the risks that these EV vehicles pose to them? Yes, we issued 22 recommendations to uh, automobile manufacturers. 16 of them have included all the information already for emergency responders in their manuals and documentation uh, to provide. Uh, we're still awaiting work on uh, the rest of uh, those um, providers, six others, they are doing work to get there. Uh, also, we asked the National Fire Protection Association and other fire uh, re uh, first responders to disseminate this information through their membership. Uh, and many of them have done so. A few were awaiting a response and we're following up on that. I would be happy to work with you on this. And so hopefully we can be in contact. And yes, uh, any recommendations you have for me to be able to push this forward so that we can uh, have answers and better protection for people because of this. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Fuchs, welcome. Since the passage of the Staggers Act, which partially deregulated the rail industry, railroads have invested more in their infrastructure, improved safety, and lowered freight rates. The Surface Transportation Board's role is to ensure that there is a balanced, independent approach to solving rate and service disputes that allows the market to function, though it retains certain authorities to act when necessary. As a member of that board, how would you ensure the board maintains a balanced regu regulatory approach? Thank you for the question, Senator. I would say two things. Um, first is public participation, considering the views of all our stakeholders, both shippers uh, and carriers. We have c competing mandates. We have to uh, protect competition and, and ensure efficiency. We also have to ensure that carriers are revenue adequate and have the incentives to invest in their infrastructure. And I think to look to the statute to focus on what's reasonable to act in accordance uh, with the rail transportation policy. Um, I think by, by listening to people and uh, having fidelity to the statute, the board can ensure balanced regulation. When you review cases that are brought before the board, do you intend to take into consideration both the particulars of each individual case as well as the effect of STB action on the entire rail system? How do you balance that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. It's, it's a complex challenge, um, as, as, as you indicate. Um, 
when we decide adjudications, we are uh, making those determinations on the facts and circumstances of the case. We consider all of the our evidence and arguments. When we're making those decisions, though, of course, for precedential decisions, we have to look at the broader impact. We take a lot of time to ensure that our determinations don't just get to an outcome, but they provide clarity because people have to operate under them. Um, it's a complex challenge uh, in, in the moment, uh, but, but we have our, our minds on both. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Fisher. If I could go to you, Mr. Uh, uh, Brooks, on a couple of uh, issues in your area. The Port of Vancouver uh, is stuck in a contract with BNSF that doesn't uh, expire, which allows them to control the access to the port exchange for managing uh, the railroad and maintenance. So the port has been trying to recruit new customers, but um, and it's invested a lot of money into trying to build that capacity. However, the port has accused BNSF of charging exorbitant fees to Union Pacific customers who need to use the track into the port and deterring would-be customers. So uh, what, what are the issues that you think you could look at here to make sure that there's a collaborative process in increasing exports? The other question I had for you deals with just our data on our system and the network and disruptions. Obviously, uh, we look a lot to compare with Canada. They have real-time information about the location of trains and their freight network. What is, in, is STB doing to improve its data on freight rail networking and including the collaboration of real-time information? Thank you for the question, Chair Cantwell. I'll start with Vancouver. Um, it's an important and ongoing issue. Rail access is critical to economic growth. I've engaged with your terrific staff and the carriers on this matter, and I'm aware that it's an outstanding um, proceeding with a private arbitration panel uh, being a contract dispute. Um, but I sincerely appreciate the outcome here will be extraordinarily impactful to the Port of Vancouver. I want to engage with the port, um, and I'd welcome the opportunity to continue to engage with your team, the carriers, and the port um, as appropriate um, to see if the board can play a constructive role. Um, as it pertains to supply chain visibility, um, this is another crucial area for the rail system. Uh, if shippers have good information about their freight, they can plan their businesses accordingly uh, to, and reduce negative effects when disruption occurs. Um, the board has been focused on, on transparency as a way to address some of these rail service problems. We expanded our service metrics uh, to include, the, for the first time on a temporary basis, uh, measures of trip plan compliance, which is like on-time on performance, as well as first last mile service, and we have a proposal pending to make those permanent. Uh, we enhanced our employment data to take a more detailed look at carriers' efforts to increase their crew base, because that was a, a major precursor to the rail service problems that we saw. Uh, we acquired service recovery plans with targets for both crew and service. Um, we mandated certain invoices uh, for, for demerge, have additional detail. We expanded our waybill uh, sample collection. You know, transparency has been the hallmark of the board in, in recent years. Um, when, I, when I assess the state of the industry in terms of shipper visibility, much more is needed. Um, but I, I, would, I would certainly um, you know, welcome the opportunity to partner to increase supply chain visibility, and, and I'm committed, um, if confirmed, uh, to continuing the board's efforts on that front. You're talking so fast, like you have to brief a member. <laughs> <laughs> So, and guess what? No other members are here right now. So <laughs> why don't you take a second and elaborate on that point? Because I, I, I want to hear what you think. And, you know, I'm, do you have capacity to do innovative things, too? Can, we, can, can you guys say, like, hey, why don't we try blockchain technology that would help, you know, you know, without specifying what content is, elaborate on a system that would give us even more uh, accuracy? But I'd love to hear your recommendations. Absolutely. <clears throat> so within the rail network, um, the, the, the carriers generally operate a system called AEID readers. They're basically scanners along the network. Um, but there's space in between the scanners. So you don't have continuous real-time visibility sometimes in between the scanners. Now, they have PTC with GPS, and some carriers are imputing some of that GPS data to, to the consist. However, when the... Uh, freight cars are not attached to the train, you might not have that coverage as well, for example, if they're in a siding or, or in a yard. Um, so there are ongoing efforts in the industry to pro try to provide GPS location-specific data. Um, there's a coalition called Rail Pulse that has class one carriers, short line carriers, rail suppliers that are trying to attach um, GPS units, but also uh, other real-time safety information 
Um, and and to, to, to your point, Chair Cantwell, what you can see, you can start to see the seeds of this data that if the carriers can get more visibility on location specific, they can leverage machine learning to optimize network plans and create capacity just by the use of technology. So, so, so I do think that there are some exciting developments going on in industry net right now, but we're not there yet. Now, you, you also asked what the board can do. You know, we have you know, reasonable rates, services, and practices authority. Our reasonable practices authority really governs mostly um, competitive relationships between carriers and, 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 and shippers. Um, I, I will say that a, a lot of, one of the complex challenges is a lot of these rail cars are owned by shippers. And I think that there's a little bit of a collective action problem where the marginal benefit for uh, a shipper, for AEID reader to GPS, may not be sufficient to justify the ROI in some cases, but perhaps if everybody was equipped, there would be some additional benefits from that. Um, it, it is not clear that the board is the proper entity to help oversee that. Um, the Department of Transportation has used its grant-making authority actually to, to initiate um, Rail Pulse. Uh, there was a, a, a grant application from carriers in the, uh, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to make that happen. And it's possible that the Department of Transportation, through its convening and conveying fun function, as well as its grant-making authority, may be best situated to address this issue. Are, are you saying that we should think about the um you know, the basis of the transportation of the cars and diversifying the ownership of that? Is that something to think about how that would speed up the delivery? Um, I, I think that the ownership of cars is because of complex operational characteristics. Say, for example, a chemical car. Chemical cars are almost exclusively owned or controlled by rail shippers because they're specialized products, and you can't really pool those across across the network. I but think the that the dray underneath is that some people have suggested like change that that part of the system. Oh, as in, as in what, what hauls um, particular containers? Yes. Um, so th th those are typically uh, managed by an entity called TTX, and there is um, uh, e extensive pooling that exists in, in, in that area. Um, th th those are, I would say on the intermodal side, those are exempt commodities. They're highly competitive. They have, compared to some of the other manifest shippers, they have an excellent service performance on a relative basis. Um, it's, so, so the carriers have active communication with, with those particular shippers. I, I think the, the, the car ownership is, is difficult because it's not, if the, even if the carriers wanted to equip all their cars, there's costs for shippers in equipping their cars. Yep. That's what makes it really complicated. And then the other element is, the rail network is extraordinarily heterogeneous. There are massive differences in people's demand and time sensitivities. So a, a, a company like UPS or FedEx, you know, they need to know where their freight is immediately. And it's not to say there's not visibility for some of the smaller shippers with bulk commodities, but it's just less important for them, and therefore they have a lower willingness to pay, and so therefore they might not be wild about um, equipping their, their, their rail cars. Well, so it's the ownership characteristics and the heterogeneity of demand that really makes it challenging to have a one-size-fits-all solution for the industry. Well, appreciate your focus on the efficiency of making sure that we continue to make technology improvements. One of those issues, the um, in 2023, 20, 20, the... Amtrak Cascade route was on time just 67% of the time. So uh, part of your responsibility is ensuring that Amtrak trains do not face undue delays from freight trains. So I don't know if you, uh, are you committed to working with us and making sure we improve the Amtrak on time experience? Absolutely, uh, Chair Cantwell. Um, the board's passenger rail authorities are an important part of what we do. They're mostly uh, codified in, in Section 24308 of our code. And in fact, um, on on-time performance under, under subsection F, we have a case right now pending. Um, so I, I'm limited in what I can say because it's an ongoing in, in investigation. Um, but I will say, generally, Congress has empowered the board to conduct investigations of um, uh, uh, on-time performance and to look uh, uh, at instances in which carriers failed to provide preference, and then we have uh, damages authority to try and ameliorate the problem. It, it, it is one of the tools that Congress has given us, and we are currently in the middle of a case on that very issue. Thank you. Senator Klobuchar. Very good. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I may be the last one here. I, we had mm -hmm. another hearing in judiciary. Um, so I'm going to ask you questions here, but I, I will say a lot of my focus is on the bridge because, uh, as you uh, may know, um, Ms. Hamandi, I was uh, the principal um, author of the bridge uh, refunding uh, bill, along with Senator Coleman, a Republican, former Republican senator from Minnesota, to get the I-35W bridge rebuilt. 
Um, and so all of this came back to the people of our state who remember exactly the, where they were when the 35W bridge collapsed, eight lane highway, eight blocks from my house, a bridge that I took my family over every single day. And as I said that day, when a bridge fell down to the middle of America, we rebuild it. And we did that in Minnesota in 339 days. We got the cap lifted on the emergency funding in two days. President Bush was out there, just like President Biden, in uh, a few days later. And in our state, it was 140,000 cars a day using that bridge. Baltimore is 31,000, but they have the added issue of the um, port and how important the economic value is, not just to Maryland, but to the entire country. We mourn the loss of those construction workers and for their families. Um, and also, the two tragedies had something else in common, and that was the investigation, so important to figure out what went wrong, but also the heroes. Um, in Baltimore, uh, the immediate response to the May Days with the um, uh, first responders blocking traffic, so many more could have been killed. In our case, um, 13 people died, but there were dozens of other vehicles submerged in that river, and the first responders ran in there. They got people out. Uh, I think of the driver of the tasty truck who could have rammed into a school bus of kids, the miracle bus that was hanging precariously on the side of the road, uh, instead veered off and lost his life, burned alive in his truck. Uh, I think about uh, Mr. Hernandez, who was the uh, school officer, um, who was the summer camp counselor on the bus of 50-some kids, and instead of running off that bus, it looked like it was gonna go right over into the Mississippi River. He got every single kid off of that bus calmly and got them all off the bus. Those are heroes. So I wanna thank you for the work your investigators are doing to be there on that thing. It's also dangerous. I know how difficult this must be. Um, and so my first question is, um, how is the NTSB coordinating with the Coast Guard and other partners to clear the wreckage and reopen uh, the channel as soon as possible? Uh, first, Senator, uh, we ha I worked for Chairman Obistar at the time that occurred. Yes. So I know it well. Yeah. And uh, our, many of our personnel who worked on that investigation continue their work at the NTSB. Uh, so what I will say for our role in this investigation, our role is the safety investigation. We have a team uh, from our Office of Marine Safety, a team from our Office of Highway Safety and our Family Assistance Team, as well as a team from our Research and Engineering uh, Office. Uh, our role is to determine what happened, why it happened, to prevent it from reoccurring, and we are still on scene on the vessel. As for uh, removal of uh, any sort of debris, and more importantly, to uh, find those loved ones who are unaccounted for, uh, that is something that the Coast Guard and many other federal partners uh, are working on. And do you have any recommendations um, at this time, does NTSB that would prevent future collisions like what we saw? Or are you just finishing the investigation or any open recommendations? We have investigated for uh, many years, uh, back to 1967, many bridge strikes by vessels. And we've issued recommendations, including one I will point out uh, that to, for uh, the U.S. Coast Guard to evaluate U.S. waterways, the type of vessel, vessels and shipping on the waterway, any volume of traffic on a bridge, any strikes to bridges, and peer protection uh, that should be in place. Uh, at the time, this was in the early 1980s, at the time the U.S. Coast Guard responded and said they did not have the authority to do that. They submitted a study from the late 70s uh, providing for types of peer protection, but there's still action that needs to occur uh, to look, uh, frankly, at how, our, how shipping has changed over the years, how transportation has changed in our waterways, the types of vessels uh, that we are seeing, the types of container ships that we are seeing, the volume of traffic, and looking at bridge designs. If, if I were a state that would, and the Department of Transportation, that's what I would be looking at now. Are these bridges 
uh, protected for the types of traffic that is going uh, going through now. Okay, thank you. Uh, quickly moving to the train derailment in Raymond, I thank you for your work there in Minnesota. Um, and NTSB determined uh, that the derailment was a broken rail. Do you agree that we must pass the Railway Safety Act immediately? Uh, on the Railway Safety Act, I will say it addresses several of uh, NTSB's open safety recommendations, including information for emergency responders. Uh, we still have work to do to conclude our East Palestine investigation uh, and issue those recommendations that will conclude at the end of June, and we will provide uh, that information uh, for the uh, committee. Uh, but we do have 190 open rail recommendations that can be acted on today. Okay, very quickly, thanks to the chair's good work, the Senate FAA reauthorization bill includes a requirement that all aircraft be equipped with a 25-hour recorder uh, will that help you in your investigation? Absolutely, and it will help operators improve safety. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar, for that provision. We appreciate your leadership on it. Senator Thune and then Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Holmandy, thank you for um, the excellent job you've done leading the NTTSB, especially as it's navigated several tragic and high-profile accidents over the past few years. Um, good to have you here in front of us today. Uh, Mr. Fuchs, uh, or should I say Patrick, it's great to see you here today. You did an ex exceptional job as a member uh, of the Commerce Committee staff when I chaired the committee, and you've done an equally exceptional job as a member of the STB. Um, based on my experience, I'm sure nothing could have prepared the agency for the high energy that you bring to public service. And um, I, we, just witn we just witnessed yes, it, yeah. and so I told him, I told him no one, he had lots of time to explain I, these I, things. I, I, love, I love the passion, um, and uh, glad to see both of your families here supporting you as well, and I want to welcome them. Um, Mr. Fuchs, as you know well, South Dakota has many small shippers, particularly in the agricultural sector, who often express concerns about the accessibility of rate review. Uh, the, Surface Transportation Board Reauthorization Act of 2015, which uh, we did as, in my uh, stint as chairman, required the STB to make rate review processes more accessible to small shippers and to expand voluntary arbitration. For that reason, I was encouraged by STB's final rule establishing a voluntary arbitration program exclusively for small rate case disputes. Understanding the rules currently subject to litigation, could you describe how this program will provide an opportunity to improve the accessibility of rate dispute resolution for small shippers. Thank you for the question, Senator. It's an honor to appear before you in this capacity. Um, as you indicate, the board has repeatedly stated that it favors alternative dispute resolution wherever possible in lieu of formal proceedings. Um, as you know well, the, the, the formal proceedings at the board can be enormously complex, particularly on the standalone cost test. Um, so following your legislation, and ex we expanded the board's regulations um, uh, on arbitration to include rates. Um, the, the program has a, a, a number of elements consistent uh, with, with the legislation to be fair and workable. For example, it has the same relief cap then that the board's final offer rate review process has. Um, it provides that the arbitration panel can decide issues of, of market dominance, and then the board simultaneously and separately uh, streamline the market dominance inquiry. So that initial threshold test to get to the rate review um, is, is faster. Um, as you point out, it is under litigation, so I am limited in what I can say. But, but I'll, I will say that, that regardless of what happens with the arbitration program, the board is not foreclosed from continuing to explore ways to streamline the rate review process. And if confirmed, I, I would con uh, continue uh, to work with the stakeholders, work with the members of this committee to figure out the best ways to conduct rate review. So uh, in developing this rulemaking with your fellow board members, can you discuss the importance of consensus-based decision making and how you will continue to work toward doing so if confirmed? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, you know, consensus has been, been really one of the foremost values the board has brought to bear uh, during my time. You know, each of my, my colleagues is, is ex extraordinarily talented, and we all have different backgrounds, and we sort of uh, recognize that each of us contributing our own expertise and the, the information that we're hearing can, can lead to, to a, sh a stronger pro uh, product. So in, in that particular context, you know, we have a board member that is an experienced litigator and who has done numerous arbitrations. You know, through my work um, on, on 
on your team, I was, I was extraordinarily familiar with the challenges that various shippers had in the board's more formal proceedings and understood sort of what was needed from a principal standpoint. So again, though I'm limited in, in going into too much detail, I will say that, you know, that, that, that is an instance where the proceeding leveraged uh, the various expertise of the, of the board members to hopefully create a stronger product, and I'm hopeful that we can uh, someday implement that type of program. Um, I've got a couple other questions. One that deals with uh, reciprocal switching, which I'll, I'll submit for the record. I do want to ask um, Chair Holmandy, as you mentioned in your testimony, the NTSB has had several, has several, I should say, ongoing investigations related to an increasing number of near misses at our nation's airports, which could easily have turned into deadly accidents. Uh, the wider use of new technologies has and will continue to improve ATC and airport situational awareness, and I also see technology playing a crucial role in training more well-rounded and well-prepared airline pilots. I know you've previously discussed this issue at length in past hearings, but could you provide an overview of NTSB recommendations to FAA that remain open, which could potentially address some of the issues underlying the recent increase in aircraft near misses? Yes, we have recommended for quite some time technology that would alert uh, air traffic controllers when there's a potential for collision. Uh, we also have recommended technology in the cockpit uh, that uh, has not been acted on by FAA. This is technology we've recommended since 2018 as a result of a almost very tragic near miss uh, where, where an Air Canada plane almost landed on top of four other full planes on a taxiway. Uh, and we issued recommendations for technology in the cockpit. And I'm sorry, it wasn't in 2018. It was actually, it's, that's actually our oldest recommendation going back 23 years. Uh, so that recommendation still needs to be acted upon, and we still hope the FAA will take action. Uh, technology that could alert pilots and not just reliant on technology for air traffic controllers and FAA funding uh, that institutes that technology could be critical uh, to preventing a potential tragedy. Thank you. I see my thank time's you. expired, Madam Chair. I look forward. Thank you both, and we look forward to getting you confirmed. Thank you. Thank Senator, thank you. Senator Blackburn, because she, she actually was on the screen, and we didn't see her earlier, so thank you. And then we have a lot of colleagues now who are here, so then we'll go to Baldwin and Rosen and Vance. Awesome. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I want to thank you all for being here for the hearing. I've got just a couple of questions that I wanted to get to. And I know Senator Klobuchar had talked about the hearing where we were in judiciary. I think she made it from Dirksen back over uh, to Russell before I did. Um, Chair Ahamadi, I want to come to you and Thank you for the work you've done, the Nashville plane crash, uh, getting back to us on different issues. But let me ask you about Boeing. The last time you were before us, we talked about Boeing and their lack of participation or um, cooperation with NTSB. And they had released a statement after the last hearing talking about documentation and the door plug. And they said this, and I'm quoting them, with respect to documentation, if the door plug removal was undocumented, there would be no documentation to share, end quote. Now, my understanding is that documenting the removal is mandatory. Uh, reporting that is mandatory. So it is disturbing to me that there seems to be Oh, I think we're having some technology issues. Do we have Senator Blackburn? Senator Blackburn, we might have lost the audio. So if you'll bring some light to that. <laughs> Senator, okay. Senator Black, Blackburn, uh, first of all, thank you for all your work on safety. I've deeply appreciated uh, speaking with you about the plane crash uh, in uh, Tennessee and appreciate all your uh, leadership on safety. Uh, 
The technology went out briefly during your questioning, and um, I think what you're asking about is the record of the work to open and close the door plug. Uh, that record should exist. Uh, it is part of Boeing's process. Uh, we do have, uh, we have requested documentation uh, for other instances where uh, there were, is an opening and closing of the door plug and uh, we have received that documentation and are going through so that are documentation. are they cooperating with you now? Yes, they are co okay. They are working very well with us. Uh, listen, Boeing has been a uh, party to many of our investigations. I'm, I, maybe I'm overly cautious, uh, but I am overly cautious when I use the word cooperating, uh, especially when we're in investigation and I have not reviewed all the facts of the investigation. Okay. Uh, so using that word gives me pause with any investigation that is open. Uh, for Boeing, we have a long-standing relationship with Boeing. Uh, they have provided us with all the documents that we've asked for that exist. They are aware that this record does not exist. They are equally concerned about the uh, process here and the escape, and we are all working together to figure out what happened to rectify the situation and anything else going forward. Excellent. Mr. Fuchs, I want to come to you for just a moment. I was recently over at University of Memphis and they have a next generation supply chain program. And we were talking about the uniqueness of Memphis, where you've got all five class A rails. And of course, the airport, the second largest cargo airport in the world. You also have um, I-40 that is coming in through there. You've got a lot of intermodal and supply chains and rail being so important to that supply chain resiliency is at the top of their list. So touch for a minute on what you see as the supply chain challenges and how you're moving forward with that. Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, I've had the privilege to, to visit uh, multiple facilities in Memphis to, uh, to, to see the importance of, of, of that hub firsthand. Um, specifically to um, res resiliency, the board has imposed accountability measures. The board is working on enhancing carriers' incentives, and we're also streamlining our processes. Um, and hopefully by the, the, the carriers being more resilient that will flow throughout the supply chain, including critical hubs uh, like Memphis. But if I could zero in <clears throat> on Memphis specifically, um, I think that this is one of the areas of the country where we could have additional collaboration between the carriers and other partners in that area. Um, I, I just was in Chicago where there is incredible collaboration between the carriers through the Chicago Transportation Coordination Office. Now I'm not suggesting that necessarily that that model has to be adopted by every part of the country, but I, I certainly think that there are additional opportunities to collaborate at those key gateways to ensure our freight keeps moving. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Fuchs, welcome back to the committee. Um, I'm always particularly encouraged to see Wisconsinites who are committed to public service. We appreciate that. Um, I'm hoping to get your thought on the Class One railroads common carrier obligation. Um, as you know, this principle requires railroads to provide service upon reasonable request and at reasonable rates. However, it unfortunately lacks a clear uh, definition. In fact, the Transportation Research Board found that the common carrier obligation uh, was poorly defined, in their words. Last year, I was proud to introduce bipartisan legislation with Senator Marshall uh, to better define and clarify the common carrier obligation with the strong support of a wide range of rail shippers and uh, rail labor unions. Could you discuss how you view the common carrier obligation as it stands today? And do you believe that additional clarification would provide more certainty to shippers in particular? Thank you for the question, Senator Baldwin. Um, the common carrier obligation is a foundational authority of the board. Um, the requirement that, that carriers provide transportation service upon reasonable request, as you point out, works together with our reasonable rates and practices authority. These are critical protections uh, for shippers, particularly the ones that lack competitive options. 
Um, in fact, you know, during my tenure, we actually partially revoked an exemption so that we could hear a common carrier case, and I approved uh, that decision. Um, the board's precedent is such that uh, we take common carrier cases on a case-by-case, fact-specific determination, and the language that the board has typically used is that we consider all relevant facts and circumstances in an individual adjudication. Um, you know, beyond, beyond the common carrier obligation, there's additional authorities that the board has um, to improve service accountability measures, but also um, some of the things we're working on to enhance carrier incentives around competition. Um, so, so, so if confirmed, you know, I, I would continue to recognize the, in, the importance of the common carrier obligation and, and um, would fairly administer the authorities granted by Congress. Um, I, I want to specifically address your, your, your comment. Yeah, I, I would defer to the judgment of, of the members of this committee and the whole of Congress and any uh, legislation on the common carrier, but I can uh, assure you that whatever Congress does, I will faithfully execute the law. Thank you. Um, in the late uh, 1970s and early 1980s, um, Congress gave the Surface Transportation Board's predecessor uh, uh, agency authority to exempt rail carriers from regulation for certain exempt commodities, including paper and forestry products, uh, certain construction materials, agriculture and food items, and others. These exemptions were created at a very different time. Uh, there were vastly different economic conditions facing uh, both the class one railroads and rail shippers. Yet, the exemptions have been largely left untouched for decades. Um, the Surface Transportation Board has reviewed these exemptions uh, several times since 2010. Um, including a proposed rule in 2016, but ultimately has not made any changes. Do you believe these exemptions merit further review uh, for potential modifications, and how do you see the board moving forward in considering these issues? Um, thank you for the question, Senator Baldwin. Um, you know, because it is a pending matter, I am limited in what I can say. Um, I, I will say that I have read the extensive shipper comments talking about how competitive conditions and other circumstances um, that led to the exemptions have changed uh, for certain commodities. Um, and you know, wh while that proceeding has been pending, the board has taken other action as it pertains to commodity exemptions. You know, I, I mentioned that we uh, um, re revoked uh, an exemption in individual adjudication. Um, we also revoked exemptions for the purpose of regulating demurrage for uh, exempt shippers to, uh, to ensure that the new protections that we imposed, um, including that, that demurrage can't be without, uh, outside the reasonable control of a shipper to avoid, could benefit all non-intermodal traffic. Um, we hosted a technical conference to, to deepen our understanding of the data. Um, and, and we have had dozens of ex parte meetings to, to engage with, with a number of the shippers in the area. Um, we have, as you point out, we do have more work to do on EP704, the big commodity exemption proceeding, and I, I, I understand that. What I, what I can tell you is that if confirmed, um, I would bring detailed knowledge of that proceeding and the concerns of shippers um, so that the board can execute its duties uh, fairly and expeditiously. Thank you. Um, my time is running out. I'll try to get in one quick uh, follow or question you can uh, answer either now or uh, for the record. Um, following unacceptable rail service disruptions from the Class 1 railroads in early 2021 and early 2022, the board adopted requirements for major railroads to report more comprehensive and customer-centric service data. Earlier this spring, the board ended its collection of these performance metrics. I want to know if that uh, information was helpful for the board as it assessed the performance of the Class 1 railroads in providing reliable and on-time service to their customers? And do you believe that the board should collect additional standardized railroad service metrics on a permanent basis? And feel free to answer that for the record as my time has run out. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. I'm gonna to go to Senator Rosen and then Senator Vance. We kind of went with two uh, colleagues on that side, two on this side, now we'll be back in order again. But anyway, Senator Rosen. Well, thank you, Chair Cantwell. I really appreciate you holding this important hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for testifying today and, of course, for your willingness to serve. The positions you've been nominated to do, they actually do play a key and critical role in keeping Americans safe from our roadways to our rail systems to our skies. And as Americans grapple with a, yet another Boeing 737 incident placing passenger safety at risk, we are reminded that while American air travel is safe and reliable as a form of transportation, it only remains so through constant vigilance, oversight, and accountability. So Chair Hamandi, 
I'd like to ask you about your agency's workforce and how you keep up with the expertise uh, that is needed to evaluate emerging technologies. So, for example, drones offer those working on infrastructure inspections and repairs and efficient and agile technology. It's capable of gathering those data sets and get in and out of all the little cracks. It can minimize time. It can prevent accidents and injuries. That's why I introduced the Drone Infrastructure Inspection Grant Act, bipartisan legislation included in the committee passed FAA bill to provide resources to state, local, tribal governments to use drone technology to virtually inspect, or visually, excuse me, visually inspect infrastructure and train employees how to properly use the drone, drones. At Hoover Dam's Tillman Bridge, we're seeing this kind of work in action with the Nevada Department of Transportation partnering with private sector teams specializing in drones to test and commercialize UAS-based bridge inspection technology. So, Chair Hamandi, how does NTSB keep up with emerging technologies like drones that provide us with these new opportunities to assess risks? And if we confirm as chair, how will you ensure that NTSB employees have the access and the needed expertise uh, that exists in private industry to investigate with the field that is so rapidly um, evolving. Thank you, Senator. And under uh, after I became chair of the NTSB, we formalized our drone program, which uh, we utilize in our investigations, and we created uh, uh, a training program for our investigators uh, to go through uh, so that they can become drone operators for our investigations. Uh, we are at a time at an age of myriad uh, emerging technologies, new ways of moving people and goods. Uh, it has made our investigations more complex and uh, our workforce uh, more than ever uh, is highly valued. Uh, certainly by me and the rest of uh, the board. I will say uh, that we are a small agency. We have just 430 people on board today. We have to make sure that we are filling vacancies, that we are growing, and they, that we are providing them with the necessary training so that they can keep up with emerging technologies uh, and continue in their educational pursuits uh, on behalf of the board, but then also uh, invest in technologies ourselves in order to carry out our safety mission. I'm happy to uh, walk through a few challenges we faced on that, but I also want to be respectful of your time uh, but it is a high priority for me. It has been throughout my uh, chairmanship and uh, will be if confirmed for a uh, second term. Thank you, I appreciate that. I also wanna add about my bill. My, my father-in-law spent 50 years as a bridge inspector. And so I think of him when I think of that bill and what it would have meant to help him uh, do his job for those uh, 50 years that he spent doing it. But we think about the safety improvements, and I know you have a most wanted list of safety improvements. For 35 years, the NTSB published its most wanted list, actually. It highlights top transportation safety improvements needed to prevent accidents, reduce injuries, and save lives. And moreover, federal law requires the U.S. Department of Transportation to report on the regulatory statuses of each of the items on the NTSB most wanted list. It reports, describes activities that DOT is taking to pursue and support NTSB recommendations for a safer national transportation network. And so um, I know in the end of 2023, you said that you're going to retire the most wanted list of safety priorities. And so does that mean that you're no longer going to need to produce this report on NTSB's safety priorities and detailing your work on that? Uh, yes, Senator, we did uh, sunset the most wanted list after careful review. Um, I can tell you with my longtime friend and colleague next to me, Patrick Fuchs, that I was one of the biggest champions when I uh, worked as a staffer in the House for our most wanted list. Uh, so, uh, But when I came to the NTSB and when I became chair, I quickly realized in speaking with our modal offices that we had numerous investigators, especially in highways, where we had seven investigators devoted uh, to implementing our most wanted list, 50% of which uh, was focused on roadway safety, rightfully. Uh, our main mission is to conduct investigations, to issue recommendations to effect change, to save lives. 
And that work will continue regardless of a list or not. Uh, I am a strong, strong advocate for safety, as, is the, as are the other members of the board. Uh, we are looking uh, for new ways of communicating our priorities. Uh, we have hundreds of recommendations that we will continue to provide uh, uh, for Congress to consider and others, and we will effectively communicate that through our social media channels and also on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Vance. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thanks to both of you for being here. Um, I've spent uh, probably too much time grilling Chair Halmady about rail safety, and I'm sure she's uh, sick of talking with me about the topic, so I'm gonna focus on you, Mr. Folks. Um, and, no, I'm kidding, obviously. Um, <laughs> that's your job, mine too. So, uh, but, but I, I wanna actually sort of pick up on something that Senator Baldwin was talking about earlier. Uh, which is this sort of data that you collected at the STB in response to some of the service disruption. So just to, to set the table, Mr. Folks, do, do I understand it correctly that the main thing that motivated that data collection in 2020, 2021 uh, was sort of pandemic-related service disruptions? Yes, that's correct, Senator. Okay. Um, so maybe, you know, I, I understand this is sort of relatively new data. You probably haven't spent that much um haven't had that much capacity to sort of fully incorporate and understand it, but I mean, any high level conclusions or considerations, I mean, anything that's especially interesting about the data you collected over the last couple of years? Absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, so first is it provided transparency into the carrier's on-time performance and first last mile service, which the board hadn't collected before. So if you talk to a rail shipper, what they wanna know is, is my freight gonna show up on time and will the railroad hit their local switch so the people who are doing the important work of loading and unloading freights can keep the economy moving. Um, the second, and, and so, so what the data did is it clearly underscored the severity of the problem. The second thing it did is it, it uh, underscored the importance of, of the labor shortage to service performance. Third is it allowed us to, to dig down uh, both geographically and by service type. And then you know, fourth is it uh, required the carriers to set six month and one year targets so we could track their progression. So you know, it, it, it's helped the agency hold the railroads accountable. Um, it's focused our oversight efforts. It's informed shipper decisions and it's also informed others. Um, so, I, so I think the data has been very valuable. Okay, um, so I'm gonna pick up on the labor shortage uh, sort of theme in a second, but I mean, have you guys noticed just the act of being required to report this information? Has that actually solved some of the service related, excuse me, the service related issues? C certainly it's been a helpful factor. Um, you know, the carriers had numerous reasons to improve, not least of which is the effects of their poor service on demand. Um, but, but, but I believe that the, the, the board's data collection was helpful. I mean, so, so, Senator, if you just look at the facts, um, you know, when we started our reporting um, around, around May of 2022, um, compared to the end of 2023, the carrier's trip plan compliance, which is that measure of service reliability, yep. increased by, by about 17 to 29%, depending on the carrier's percentage points. Um, and, you know, at the same time, the carriers increased their train and engine crew all of them by more than 500, some of them closer to 1,000. Um, and I have been gratified to hear from shippers about their using both the employment and the service data to inform, inform their decision making, which provides a private sector incentive, additional private sector incentive uh, on the carrier. So I do think it's been a helpful contributing factor. Okay, uh, that's, that's helpful to know. And just, you know, being mindful of time, <clears throat> you mentioned the labor shortage issues. And, you know, one of the concerns that I have is that very aggressive staff reduction and the, especially the class one railroads uh, contributes in some ways to service disruptions. Uh, do you see any evidence of that in, in your data? What's, what's actually going on with the labor shortage? Is that because the train companies aggressively cut back or is it because they can't find people or is it both? Uh, th th thank you, uh, Senator. You know, I, I would say if you look at the employment shortage, um, during the pandemic, it, it was a combination of both. Sure. And in addition to the factual predicate that I laid out, I, I would just point out that the railroads have stated to the board on the record that the labor shortage contributed to their service problems. Yep, got it. Okay, um, so, so one just last comment, and I'll, I'll yield back the remainder of my time, is you know, we, we, myself and a number of the colleagues that I have on this committee have worked on a railway safety bill. And one of the arguments we sometimes run up against uh, is that if the bill passes, the two-man crew provision will radically reduce service 
uh, in the rail industry, that it will significantly cut back the quality of service. And you know, one of the, the interesting observations is there have been some service issues related to staffing well before the Rail Safety Act was even envisioned. And certainly, of course, it hasn't gone into effect as law yet. So I find it a little rich that the railways want to blame a bill that doesn't actually exist in law for service disruptions that existed uh, for, for now many years. So it seems a little absurd to me, but that's just my biased opinion. I yield back. Thanks to the chair. Thank you, Senator Vance. Very astute observation. Um, I want to, I know we're waiting for one more member to show up, but um, Chair Hamadi, I wanted to clarify on your investigation on the Baltimore Bridge collapse. You talked about electrical engineers on your team. Do you have the resources to um, evaluate this fully? Yes, we do have the resources to evaluate this fully, but let me just uh, paint a picture here. We have uh, 13 marine investigators right now, 13 in the agency, many of which are engineers. Uh, they are hard, highly qualified. More than half of them went to this particular uh, accident, as well as 20% of our Office of Highway Safety, uh, and, which has um, uh, 20 investigators, and then uh, 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 a few from uh, three individuals from our research and engineering team. So we certainly have the means to carry out this investigation. And, it and will be a priority, but going, but you, but in looking at our investigations, it will uh, put aside some of the other workload that they have because they are still doing investigations of other. Uh, accidents and incidents. So here's what I will say. This team just lost their director right before this bridge collapsed. Their director died suddenly. This is a close-knit team. He died suddenly at the beginning of March. It was a huge loss for the NTSB that we are still reeling from. Over half of these investigators went to this bridge collapse. They are incredibly dedicated. I looked at the entire team and looked at their expertise. Now, and I've seen some media reports of, does the NTSB have marine safety expertise? We have conducted well over 2,100 marine safety investigations since we've existed, in, uh, since we were established in 1967. We've issued 2,600 recommendations. We have a highly skilled staff. In total, the expertise on this particular event exceeds over 400 years of experience and expertise in marine safety, however, we, this team needs four more marine investigators. So I looked at, and thank, first of all, let me say, we, need, uh, we needed the additional funding. This committee was instrumental on a bipartisan basis of helping us get increased funding in FY24 through the appropriations bill, and I greatly, greatly appreciate that. However, that needs to grow over time. We've been stagnant. I want to provide you, if you don't mind, a snapshot of the real life choices we have to make on a daily basis. And this is real. I have to choose on a daily basis. Do I invest in four marine investigators? Or do I invest, and this comes from my list, in cybersecurity enhancements, training on new methods of handling evidence, replacing two digital microscopes that are no longer serviced and have no spare parts, purchasing an overhead crane because we don't have one in our new high base space in order to move heavy equipment and fuselage, entering into an agreement with the State Department to get our personnel who, are, who uh, may be overseas during political or health upheavals back into the United States. That agreement never existed before I became chair never existed. That is, some, that is a cost. Improving our report forms right now, the general aviation community, and they will be clapping after I say this, the GA community has to, when they report an accident and incident on our 6120 form, you have to print it out, fill it out, you have to upload it, email it before it's in our system. It's incredible, that is old. Right? We want to provide those enhancements so they can just do it digitally and it pops up right in our information. We want to do that, but that is a cost. Making doors accessible in bathrooms, because, so my personnel uh, can get in bathrooms and doors. Do you know uh, we had to, 
This is a true thing that happened. Uh, our, our air conditioning in the chair's office and in several related offices broke. We were quoted $30,000 to fix it. And uh, also, we were quoted $20,000 uh, in order to make doors accessible, three doors accessible, four, three or four doors accessible, which wasn't done before. What did I choose? I chose to go without air conditioning. My staff was not happy. But for seven months, I went without air conditioning to do the right thing. So we are good stewards of our limited dollars. But I will tell you, we, we need resources. This is the, these are the real choices. I get it. I get the conversation about federal overspending. I understand the concerns. I understand that the median wage in the state of Tennessee is $52,000. I understand that. But I also understand we have such an important safety mission. And investing in that mission, I don't care about me. I care about the six workers on that bridge, their families. I care about our investigators. I care when there's not a backup to them and they're on duty 24-7, 365 days a week. That is what we invest in. We are an investment in safety. So thank you, thank you. but we need more. Thank you, thank you Chair Hamadi, and thank you for um, reminding us of your loss. You did a, a very great tribute to him at our last hearing, so thank you so much for you know, expressing the concerns of your colleagues in the loss of that individual. Um, I just want to make sure, so you have the electrical engineering investigative team that you need, yes? Or we still Sorry, need Sorry, I didn't answer that. Yes, we do. Uh, okay. What we do need, because this is technology that exists on the vessel, it is a, a components on the vessel, so we do need the expertise of Hyundai to help us in getting that information. Can we have outside experts as part of that? Yes, we have the internal expertise as well. But we do need to get uh, the manufacturer who, who has come here uh, to assist us both with the circuit breakers and the electrical power system. So we are working together. Thank you so much. Senator Markey. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Um, Chair Hamadi, thank you for being here today. I'd like to discuss a subject that's very important to uh, both of us. Building safe, complete streets. For too long, our transportation system has prioritized gas guzzling, deadly, low occupancy cars that pollute our air and endanger road users. Instead of building safe streets, we built risky roads that chose speed over safety and four wheel drive over fairness. Despite recent advancements in auto safety technologies, this is crazy. The numbers are crazy. 2022 was the deadliest year for pedestrians in America since 1981. That's unbelievable. Our cars today are way safer than they were in 1981. So why are the same number of people dying? Because the roads haven't changed. So Chair Hamadi, do you agree that the design of our roads must always uh, keep every road user in mind? All road users. We cannot just look traditionally uh, we focused on a car culture, on getting uh, people in vehicles from A to B most efficiently and in the fastest manner. We have to look at the safety of all road users and design our streets accordingly. So thank you. And that's why I uh, introduced my Complete Streets Act, which will require states to dedicate a portion of their highway funds for projects that prioritize pedestrians, bicyclists, and other road users. And that bill finally puts livability, the health of our planet, and the safety of people above everything else. I'd also like to discuss the dangers of autonomous vehicles. <clears throat> Today, large tech companies are deploying so-called automated driving systems that can transport people around communities without a human driver. While there are numerous examples of serious safety incidents involving these vehicles, the National Highway Transportation Tra uh, Traffic Safety Administration has focused on retroactive recall investigations and additional data uh, collection. While these actions are a good start, <clears throat> autonomous vehicles present new safety risks and require proactive solutions. So 
Madam Chair, do you agree that the federal government could do more to protect road users from autonomous vehicles? Yes, Senator. In fact, we've issued recommendations for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to uh, uh, and for states to really focus in on 12 key safety elements that uh, the Department of Transportation itself uh, put in a 2017 report, Automated Driving Systems 2.0, A Vision for Safety. And, we've re and that includes operational design domain. So, yes. And finally, I'd like to talk about the importance of your agency. Uh, the National Transportation Safety Board is the lead detective on all incidents involving transportation safety in our country. It's also our national conscience, the angel on our shoulder whispering in our ear to always prioritize safety. Under your leadership in roughly the last year, the NTSB led investigations on numerous terrifying safety incidents, including a major trail derailment, a train derailment, a plane bursting open mid-flight, and now the destruction of a major bridge. Throughout all of these disasters, you have steadily followed the facts and provided critical recommendations that steer us towards safety. And amazingly, your agency does this work with roughly the same staff power it has had since 25 years ago in 1997. Given your agency's impressive performance and the recent safety incidents, the NTSB deserves further investment and resources. So Madam Chair, do you agree that we must increase your resources so that you can conduct timely and responsive investigations? I absolutely agree, Senator. In fact, uh, I think it would be really devastating, incredibly devastating to the agency to have flat funding in the out years as currently proposed uh, in the uh, Senate FAA reauthorization bill. We hope that that increases over time. Great. And, uh, and we thank you for all of your great work. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. you, Senator Markey. Senator Capito. To personally give us some of your reports is my I think my is it not on? Is your light on? Hello? <laughs> All right, I have to scoot over. Start over with this. Okay, uh, Chair Hammity, again, thank you uh, loud, more loudly for coming to my office and talking, particularly we talked last about the uh, the Alaska Air, Airways uh, incident. And we've obviously talked a lot about some other incidences. But one of the things we have talked about last year, the issue of the two-hour voice recorder, uh, in a cockpit voice recorder, and one of the priorities that I made in the FAA reauthorization, which I'm glad to see made it in, was to make it uh, the 25-hour uh, voice recording. I think you said that that would help a lot in your investigations and really clarify that. Um, and so I think Senator Markey mentioned that after an accident, you make a lot of recommendations. We have a thousand recommendations that have never really been implemented. How, how, how do you view that and how can we help you implement those recommendations, help, help make those recommendations become more effective and maybe uh, change some situations? I mean, that's gotta be frustrating for you. Well, and just to clarify, we do issue a lot of recommendations, but here's the success of our process. When the NTSB conducts an investigation, we work with entities, uh, we bring them in as parties to our investigation. Uh, they become technical experts for our investigation. And then during our analysis phase, we separate off and do our own independent analysis. Say with the Alaska 1282, Boeing is one of the parties. Alaska is one of the parties, several unions. And so uh, what that cooperation, what that work does together when we are working together uh, on scene and in the investigative phase, the fact-finding phase, a lot of recommendations are adopted favorably by our parties because of that collaborative work. Actually, over 80% of our recommendations are closed accept acceptably by our parties because of that. There are the remaining ones, which we hope, if uh, are not acted on, uh, that you and others will consider for action. So while there's still some open recommendations, the vast majority of those do get enacted one way or the other. Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. Thank that's, you, that's Senator. Good. Thanks for that clarification. 
Uh, Mr. Fuchs, I wanted to ask about uh, reciprocal switching. Um, uh, Senator Baldwin and I wrote, uh, sent a letter to Chairman Oberman in October expressing our support for the reciprocal switching proposed rule. Got my letter here that I would like to enter into the record, Madam Chair, without objection. Thank you. Can you provide an update and tell us how critical it is for the STB to work unanimously like you did with, uh, in this particular issue? And, and update me on that issue. Absolutely. Thank you for the question, mm -hmm. uh, Senator. I, I would say that a reciprocal switching is the highest priority of the board right now. We have immense staff resources literally working around the clock. Um, we reported to this Congress um, in, the, in the chairman's quarterly report that we expect to be uh, concluded on reciprocal switching in April. And um, if the hard work of our staff and the members is any indication, we'll meet that deadline. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chair Hamity, I want to talk about the Francis Scott Key Bridge incident, but sort of ties into the first question I asked you on the voice recordings. I understand in some of your testimony before I came into the room that you had expressed uh, the lack of information from the cargo ship side in terms of what they were seeing, how they, uh, what kind of cameras, what kind of data. Can you expound on that? And, and what kind of requirements are there for foreign flag vessels, which that one was, correct, to... Um, to have these kinds of uh, reporting data available? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Uh, for voyage data recorders, they're very different than flight data recorders and uh, cockpit voice recorders. It's a limited set of data. It's really a snapshot of uh, the major systems on a vessel. Uh, this one in particular had a newer model, but again, it's really basic information, uh, speed being one of them. Uh, what we need uh, is more information, more parameters, and we have recommended that in the past uh, so that, in, in fact, uh, more data parameters that are equivalent uh, to international maritime organization uh, standards. Mm -hmm. uh, we would like to see that. Uh, it is a longstanding recommendation, and we'd also like to see voyage data recorders included in all passenger vessels, including ferries. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would say just anecdotally on in terms of that accident, um, while you know we lost six lives and that that's just devastating to think, I would have to congratulate, I suppose, the Maryland State Police, the Maryland DOT, whoever, however, prevented cars from getting on that bridge within short periods of time. I mean, that tells me not only is, is technology saving lives, because I'm sure there's a lot of technology involved there, but uh, you can imagine that first car that was stopped or the one that was 30 cars back going, oh, I'm going to be late to work, and then realizing 45 minutes later their life just got saved because of the aggressive uh, work that probably some of the grounds that you have laid uh, in your work, but also the ability for them to stop those cars from getting onto that bridge was just, in my view, uh, amazing to me. And uh, so I congratulate them. I want to tell them publicly that. I don't know if you have a comment on that as well. Yes, 31,000 uh, vehicles per day uh, av on average uh, over this bridge. It was, those actions were truly heroic and within minutes. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Capito. I thank all my colleagues. I thank the witnesses. Uh, I think you've demonstrated why you deserve to have a vote out of this committee. Uh, before we close the hearing, I have one more question. If confirmed, will you pledge to work collaboratively with the committee provide thorough and timely responses to our request for information as we put together and address policy issues and appear before the committee when requested. Yes, Chair Cantwell. Yes, Chair Cantwell. Well, that concludes uh, our hearing today. The Senate will have until close of business Monday, April uh, 15th, to submit questions for the records. Witnesses will have until close of business April 22nd to respond. Again, that concludes the hearing. Thank you all very much.